Today, we will be discussing the cerebral cortex of the brain, which refers to the outer layer of gray matter that covers the two cerebral hemispheres. The cerebral cortex contains nerve cell bodies and is approximately 2 to 4 millimeters thick. This layer has many folds. The elevation called gyri and the grooves are called sulci. The cerebral cortex is distinct from the cerebrum, the forebrain. The cerebrum describes the two cerebral hemispheres, the right and the left. The cerebral cortex, the outer part, has a wide range of functions, such as perception and awareness of sensory information, and planning and initiation of motor activity. It also has a role in decision-making, motivation, learning, memory, attention, problem-solving, and conceptual thinking. The cerebral cortex is organized into six lobes, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, the insular lobe, and the limbic lobe. Let us talk about each of these lobes separately and look at some clinical anatomy. As the name suggests, the frontal lobe lies underneath the frontal bone and is the most anterior region of the cerebrum. It is the largest lobe of the cortex and contains the prefrontal cortex, premotor cortex, primary motor cortex, and Broca's area. This lobe is responsible for controlling voluntary movement, and its associated areas are involved in personality, mood, higher intellectual function, social conduct, and language. Injury to the frontal lobe. When there is damage to the frontal lobe, it can be due to trauma, stroke, infection, brain tumors, dementia, and other degenerative brain diseases. Injury to this lobe has many presentations. Common clinical signs and symptoms are changes in personality and behavior and an inability to problem solve. Injury to the motor cortex presents with contralateral weakness. These personality changes were beautifully documented in a case that affected Phoenix Cage, an American railroad construction foreman. Gage suffered a severe brain injury from an iron rod penetrating his skull through his frontal lobe, of which he miraculously survived. After the accident, Gage's personality completely changed. Where once he was a competent, forearmed, and reasonable person, he lost his inhibitions and became impulsive, inappropriate, violent, indulging, and displayed poor problem solving. The parietal lobe is located underneath the parietal bone, between the frontal lobe anteriorly and the occipital lobe posteriorly. The parietal lobe is important in integrating sensory stimuli. The cortical association areas regulate control of language, calculation, and visuospatial functions. Some clinical anatomy. Injury to the parietal lobe often occurs due to trauma, such as from a car accident or fall, but it can also occur from a stroke. Injury often presents with attention deficits, such as contralateral hemispatial neglect syndrome, where the patient does not pay attention to one side of their body, contralateral to the side of injury. So here, a right sided parietal lobe injury results in left-sided neglect, left side being contralateral to the right-sided injury. Damage along the optic tract within the parietal lobe results in contralateral homonymous hemianopia. Here, injury to the right parietal lobe causes left homonymous hemianopia. You lose the left visual field. Gertzman syndrome can occur when there is also injury to the left parietal lobe in the dominant hemisphere. This presentation includes right to left confusion, agraphia, which is difficulty with writing, a calcula, which is difficulty with mathematics, aphasia, disorders of language, and agnosia, inability to perceive objects normally. 
The temporal lobe lies underneath the temporal bone, inferior to the frontal and parietal lobes. This lobe contains the primary auditory cortex and Wernicke's area. The cortical association areas of the temporal lobe are responsible for retention of visual memory and language comprehension. Injury to the temporal lobe. The most common cause of temporal lobe injury is cerebrovascular events, such as a stroke. A patient who has injury to the temporal lobe presents with agnosias, which are recognition deficits. Agnosia comes from the Greek word agnosia, meaning ignorance. Examples include auditory agnosia, where the patient is unable to recognize basic sounds, and prosopagnosia, which is a failure to recognize faces. Injury to Wernicke's area presents with receptive aphasia. Aphasia comes from the Greek a, meaning not or absent, and phasia, meaning to speak. So basically translates to unable to speak properly. People with Wernicke's aphasia are able to speak fluently normally, but their speech lacks meaning. This is because their language comprehension is impaired. They don't understand the information they're receiving, hence the term receptive aphasia. Whereas injury to Broca's area, which is in the frontal lobe, this causes expressive aphasia. Patients here are able to comprehend and process what is being said to them, but they are unable to express themselves properly, and so presents with halting and effortful speech. They look very frustrated because they're unable to say what they want. The occipital lobe is located below the occipital bone. It is the most posterior part of the cerebrum. The occipital lobe contains the primary visual cortex, meaning that its cortical association area is responsible for vision. Injury to the occipital lobe. So common causes of injury to this lobe are trauma, neoplastic lesions, infections, and stroke. Because the occipital lobe contains the primary visual cortex, injury presents with visual defects, such as contralateral homonymous heminopia, sparing the macula specifically. Quadrantinopia can also occur, which is the loss of vision in one of the quarters of the visual field. Here is someone with right sided occipital injury resulting in left quadrantinopia, and then again, injury here results in left homonymous heminopia, sparing the macula. Visual field of someone with right homonymous heminopia, with the macula being impaired, occurs in injury to the left parietal lobe. The insular lobe is found deep to the lateral sulcus. This lobe plays a role in the receiving, processing, and integration of many types of information, such as language, visual, vestibular integration, taste, and pain sensation. Injury to the insular lobe can result in difficulties with sensory perception, such as touch, taste, sound, smell, perception of pain, language, and emotion, in particular the emotions of disgust and anger. Interestingly, chronic pain can alter the function and anatomical structure of the insular lobe, resulting in thinking disruption and changes in emotional state. The last lobe is the limbic lobe. It's located on the medial part of each hemisphere and surrounds the corpus callosum. It is a component of the larger limbic system, meaning it is involved with emotional and behavioral expression. In particular, the limbic lobe contains areas concerned with the modulation of emotions, visceral and autonomic functions, learning and memory. Injury to the limbic lobe can result in epilepsy, dementia, changes in mood, personality or impulse control, psychiatric disorders and disorders of the endocrine system. Injury can also lead to aphasia. So in summary, in this video we talked about the cerebral cortex, the outer layer of grey matter that covers the two cerebral hemispheres, 
as well as discussing the anatomy. We talked about the lobes of the cerebral cortex, the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, the occipital, the insula, and the limbic lobes. We also discussed the function of each of these lobes and how injury to these lobes uh, would present clinically. Thank you for watching.